H2K Emphasis provides world-class online IT training, staffing and software testing solutions to customers worldwide. H2K Emphasis – How we are different from our competitors. 100% job oriented training, hands on project work, cloud test lab, resume preparation and review, mock interviews, robust syllabus, one time fee and lifetime access to classes, access to recorded sessions of live classes. H2K Emphasis has won the trust of thousands of students worldwide. For a free demo class, visit us at h2kemphasis.com. It was internally contained compared to reference. And once after that, it will be going to contain several number of services. So the naming, which is nothing but your JNDA. JNDA is nothing but the abbreviation for that is Java Naming Device Directory and Interface. The purpose of using JNDA is whenever you want to create an object, whenever you want to create an object, that will be used across the JVMs. Across the JVMs in the sense, you want to make make it available to your remote clients. So you are just make, creating one particular object and you want to make it available to remote clients. And so for that purpose, what you will do is, you will be going to register that particular object in a naming and directory interface. So once you have registered the object in a JNDI, so all the remote clients, remote clients in the sense, the application was not available within the same JVM. So those are all called as remote clients. See, even uh, if I start one JVM, one JVM from my Eclipse, and if I start one more JVM by using command prompt. So if you want to talk between these two JVMs, you need some kind of mechanism between those two JVMs. So, if you want to access an object that is available on a remote JVM or another JVM, you need to have a definite identification for the object. So that identification will be going to be provided by using the JNDI. So the JNDI is for registering your object by a specific name. And the next next module is persistence. We already we have already discussed about persistence. Persistence, the JPA, which is used for contacting the database, or which will be going to represent a definite row in a table or an entity, which represents a specific row in database. The persistence module, which will be going to talk to the database, and uh, we we have already explained related to JPA, which is our persistence framework. And the next one is transaction management. So the transaction management, normally transactions why we will follow the asset properties, atomicity, isolation, I didn't remember the remaining four, I'm sorry. So asset properties normally we will follow to maintain a transaction. So whenever you are going to perform some credit card kind of stuff, let us say you have processed the credit card for one particular transaction. You are processing for one particular transaction and you have built, you have built that client or you have built the credit card, but finally the transaction got failed. So at that point of time, you are supposed to reward the amount whatever that you have built using, using the credit card. So those two operations should be performed or else those two operations should be not at all performed. So either all the operations should be performed or else the revert, the revert should also happen in the proper way. So for that purpose only the transactions will be going to come into the picture and your application server has the capability of maintaining those transactions also. And the next one, messaging module. The messaging module, you have the option of directly contacting the JMS, the JMS provider. You can just configure the JMS queues or topics on your application server and your application server has the capability of receiving those messages and holding it at the server level until and unless your server has up and re 
available to receive those messages. So there is one another module messaging that's also available at your application server. And the Java mail. The Java mail is nothing but it will be going to contact the SMTP port. The SMTP is which is used for mail communication, the mail exchange. So whenever you want to send a mail from your application, you will have the option of directly sending a mail by using SMTP, SMTP port or the Java mail service. And you have the option of receiving those messages by using the SMTP port associated to your application server. It's just like uh, our Tomcat, which has a GUI representation. We have already seen the Tomcat GUI representation. So in the same way, your application server also has the capability of displaying all the information in terms of GUI, the GUI representation. But the GUI representation, just not like your Tomcat, it has more flexibility. So JMS, the so JMS messaging related stuff, you can easily configure based on the GUI representation. No need to go and edit any kind of XML files or no need to go and verify uh, any kind of log files. You have the option of verifying them in the GUI representation itself. Not only is the messaging kind of stuff, if you want to do the load balancing kind of stuff or if you want to create a certain number of server or if you want to maintain a managed server or a clustering, so those kind of stuff, they are not at all available with respect to your web server. They are only available with respect to your application server. See, if you are working only for a small project, then uh, it will be fine if you go ahead with uh, only one server. And there is no requirement for load balancing kind of stuff. But if you are handling a big project which might receive 1000 requests per second, so in that case, your single server is not at all capable of handling all the requests. Your thread will be going to sit idle, or your thread will be going to sit busy, and all the remaining requests will be going to keep idle. So, in those cases, in production or setting environment or lab environment kind of stuff, normally people will deploy it as a cluster box or managed server box. Cluster nothing but there are several servers available which will be going to manage under a single admin which will be going to share the resources or the application. But all the servers will be going to maintained by a single admin server. It, it will be like a single admin server will be going to sit at the top level which will be going to contain several low level managed servers. And finally, the deployment. By using GUI representation, you have the option of deploying the application. Or you, if you if you don't want the application to be running, you have the option of stopping the application. And the advantage is it's not required for you to restart the server. You, if you want, you can just stop that particular service or stop that particular business component, and that will be going to undeploy from the server. So the GUI representation will be going to provide all these options, whatever that we have discussed, and we'll be going to see with respect to our application, JWAS application server. Okay, yeah, one second, Sandeep. Okay. Instances and server means the same thing. Instance so I'm sorry, I think you know, I think what I meant was, you know, way I mean just the probably terminology for me is you know, when we talked about so application server, we are essentially talking about the the installation there, right? So the application server installation. Or is it where you essentially clone the you create you run the same executive Google or I guess No 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 no. You'll be going to deploy the server on different ports. Oh, yeah. Same. Okay. Yeah, yeah. See, you have the option of creating the environment or creating the server or deploying the server on different boxes. And what you'll do is uh, you'll specify that one of them is admin server and the remaining all are managed server. 
managed server 1 and managed server 2 managed server 3 so this manage this admin was available on let us say 75.25.97. dot 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 within the same lang sixty four and let us say this is available on dot sixty five dot sixty six and dot sixty seven so from your admin what you will tell is you are having three managed servers server one server two and server three and on top of your admin or at the admin level itself you'll just write a software program you'll write a software program so whenever any request comes the request will be going to come to your software program and your software program will see take a look at server 1 whether it is busy or not or what is the load level take a look at server 2 take a look at server 3 if your server was down this software program will be going to verify whether the managed server is up or not. If it is not, if it was down, it won't send the request or forward the request to that. So once after this, your server 1 will be going to receive the request. Uh, server 3 will be going to receive the request and it will be going to respond back to the client. So this is called load balancing. And this load balancing is managed by app server itself here. Yeah, you can have a software program. As I mentioned, the load balance, there are plenty of load balances available in the market. Oh. oh. Yeah. So it's a, it's a separate, it's a separate app. Oh yeah, it's a separate app. app. Correct. Oh, okay. Yeah, load balancing, it won't be done by our uh, enterprise. Sorry, application server. Okay. Well, so one, one, uh, what it can do is it can manage all the servers, but the load, whatever the requests that are receiving, it will be going to distributed by external software program only. But what they can do is they have the option. See, currently we have deployed, we have specified that as managed server. We have the option of specifying it as a cluster also. Cluster means uh, you can have managed servers and within the managed server, you can again contain several engines. This is Kerberos architecture several engines and these several engines will be going to share the resources so if at all if it is a resource pool which will be going to be available with respect to the application server so all these engines will be going to share these resources this is another kind of mechanism so what does engine mean here? Are they meaning the it's, it's just like a normal server, normal server only. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Internally, those are also separate servers, and each engine will be going to run on a separate port. See, they are just like normal servers only. Oh, okay. They'll be going to run on 7001, 8001, 9001. Okay. Yes. What you will do is, uh, you will be going to contain, see now, you are, you have created three engines here, three engines here, three engines. So totally you have nine servers available now. So that means, nine servers will be going to receive the request, which means you can say, thousand requests you can handle easily. If you are having plenty of hardware, it's not required to create the number of engines at the same box level. You can create nine different boxes, but if you create nine different boxes, you are going to place so much cost for the RAM and the hardware. That's the reason they have designed in such a way like within the same hardware, you can just increase the RAM and no need to get too much of the hardware and you can create a, as many required engines. That's one of the other advantage with respect to this architecture. Yeah, okay. And, and, um, and you can stop me if I'm going way too much out of the <laughs> conversation yeah. here. Stop yeah, no sure. So, um, this, um, in, 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 when you have build them environment for QA versus production, you essentially mm -hmm. build a similar architecture in every place or mm -hmm. I guess not, no. not so many servers, but, uh, at least. Yeah. Admin and one managed server or. Oh yeah. See, uh, I'll tell you exactly. 
if, if at all if your production server contains 50 engines which will be going to maintain under a admin server then within your QA you will just replicate it in the same way like QA will be going to contain 3 or 4 engines. Hmm. Okay. Because uh, they can't put too much hardware at testing level. I got it. Yeah, that's how we have also implemented it uh, in uh, in all our other projects also. And production admin is pretty needed regardless whether you have... Oh, yeah. Server See, your admin server, normally your admin server can do health check kind of stuff whether all the engines are up or not or all the managed servers are running or not. They can do a keep alive kind of stuff. They'll be going to verify and uh, if at all the resource is full or not. And you'll be going to, it will be going to inform to the admin whether it was up or down. And once after that, you, 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 sorry, your GUI, the GUI representation will be going to specify the admin status and all the engines status. So by looking at that admin page, you'll be going to identify, yeah, that particular engine was not up. So go on and verify that particular engine log. So, your admin is just like a central control wherein uh, normally people won't prefer to deploy any kind of application from the admin server. So, admin is just a um, server dedicated to oh, yeah. your configuration, but it doesn't yeah, yeah. process the request. Right? Yes, correct. It's only for, uh, so normally, that's, uh, that's not a standard or uh, it's not a constrained way. You can deploy, no issue. But Normally, people won't prefer to deploy applications onto admin server. Okay. Thank you. I think um, that helps. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Sorry, Sandeep. Go ahead. Krish, uh, I had a question about that uh, JMS thing. Uh, yeah, we'll come back to JMS uh, in weekend class. Okay, you told me that you know it's a separate middleware server, right? That that whole request it's a separate server when compared to the client and. Uh, no, no. Currently, we are using our application server itself, right? I have mentioned that our application server has the capability of configuring the middleware, the messaging module also. Just for representation, I have specified that as a separate module. Okay, so does this capability, you know, uh, come embedded with all the? Uh, Application servers like yeah. uh, WebLogic, WebSphere, everything, or uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, they should provide because uh, once they have called as application server, means they are supposed to support all these services. Then why do they go for another uh, message broker in the sense of MQ or something like that? You know, if Mes- it comes in built yeah. with the app server. Re- I just explained, right, all those scenarios like uh, why we'll go for an MQ. Because MQ is oh. capable of handling or holding those messages and has the representation of the message. Oh, okay, whereas JMS do, cannot do JMS, that. Yeah, JMS doesn't show you what kind of message. See, if at all, uh, JMS, has the, JMS has received a message and sometimes if, it, if the server was not responsive for some time and uh, if the application server was restarted and then all your messages were gone. They won't be available. But at your MQ level, those messages will be still available at the server level. Oh, makes sense, Krishna. This, this last point was, I uh, know, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, because MQ is paid version. <laughs> First thing is. Okay. So IBM, they have developed a full length middleware communication model, mm-hmm. which is nothing but MQ. And they have the flexibility of storing the requests and uh, they have the data power which will be going to maintain all those messages. And you can you can sit and see those messages in the middleware and you can change those messages if at all if the server wants in a separate way. Let us say the client is sending the date in 03 slash 08 slash 2012. But the server wants it as March. 08-2012. This kind of translation your middleware has the capability of editing those data and they can do the transformation. They can do the transformation and they can append 
or they can embed the data for the particular field and can submit to the server. Your middleware can do those type of transformation. Oh, okay. Yeah, your JMS is just like uh, queuing. It will take the message and pass it onto the server. That's what it will do. Fine, Krish. Got it, man. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, we'll come back to the JMS uh, once we uh, we have started with one of the EJB, EJBs. I uh, have explained only high level application server means it's like uh, it's like Java only. Again, one more ocean. It consists of a lot of information related to application server. You need to identify how to how to manage those servers or how to manage the cluster or how to create a cluster or how to create or how to assign the data or how to create the queues for messaging or how to provide the transaction kind of stuff, the monitoring tools, how to associate a monitoring tool to your application server. So these kind of stuff you will you'll come to know once you have entered into any kind of uh, application server project. Your application server contains web server as well because it was supposed to handle some kind of HTTP request. Sometimes uh, we don't want to go for a separate server and we want to receive HTTP request. So that's the reason they have embedded your web server also inside application server. And one another difference between your web server and application server is until now we have discussed about jar files, war files, Java archive, and web archive. Your enterprise server or your application server consists of another model which is enterprise archive file. The enterprise archive file has the capability of holding jars and wars. It can place, you can place several number of jar files into your EAR files or you can place war files also into your EAR files. See, EAR or war or jar, nothing but just like your archive file, zip file or rare file. So your application server will be going to explode that particular archive file, will be going to read all the Java components that are required. All your business components they will be deployed onto the server using ER file, enterprise archive file. So once you have written any kind of EJBs, you will be going to develop the ER and that ER will be going to deploy onto the server. Let us start our EJBs. See, just now only we have discussed about uh, the most of the stuff our container will be going to provide and the remaining things like uh, remotability which means uh, it will be going to provide access to the remote objects. So whenever someone has asked, go and get the reference for that particular beam available inside the JVM. It has the capability of providing that particular object and return it back to the, return it back to the instance or the client. Messaging, we have seen that one. And coming back to EJBs, EJBs are available with respect to two versions the 2.1 and 3.0. 2.1 is older version. It's pretty much older version and once after that, those guys didn't touch EJVs at all. Those Spring application or Spring, Spring framework or web services came into the market and uh, what they have done is once of releasing JDK5, which consists of annotation. They have again visited or revamped EJB and they have released the next version which is EJB 3.0. EJB 3.0 is plain old Java objects or plain old 
जावा इंटरफेस कोजो और कोजी क्लैक विद जेडी के पाए वी हैव रिलीज्ड एनोटेशंस जावा हैज सम हैज रिलीज्ड एनोटेशंस यूर ईजेबी इज नथिंग बट ए कोजो विथ ए एनोटेशन इन ईजेबी थ्री पॉइंट जीरो इफ यू मैं अबाउट ए बीन मीन नथिंग बट ए प्लेन ओल्ड जावा ऑब्जेक्ट सो जस्ट लाइक हाउ यू कैर डिफाइंड द एंटिटी क्लास इन यूर हाइबरनेट और यूर फॉर्म बीन इन यूर फर्स्ट फ्रेमवर्क इन ईजेबी ऑल्सो यू विल बी गोइंग टू कंटेन द सेम फॉर्म बीन और द एंटिटी So here they will be going to call as Kojo, plain old Java object, which consists of certain business logic as well, and along with that, each and every class, each and every business class will be going to contain certain annotation that will form your EJB 3.0 piece. Your EJB 2.1. First of all, why? why people will feel that this particular 2.1 is very complicated your ejb 2.1 is framework dependent see first of all what is meant by ejb from our developer perspective it's just like a java program which will be going to deploy onto the ejb container so you will be going to write a java program and you will be going to deploy it as a bean onto your ejb container or your ejb framework so that will be going to become as a ejb component and make it available to service the clients but whenever you are mentioning that this is a bean this is a kind of bean or the enterprise java bean that means you need to provide some kind of information to your container so to provide the particular information to container you are supposed to implement implement certain interfaces even in our script framework also whenever you have mentioned that you are writing some action class you will be going to definitely extend the org dot apache dot script dot action class so here also in the same way whenever you have mentioned that you are going to write a bean a business logic bean you will be going to implement some kind of interface whenever you are going to implement an interface means you are tightly coupled to the framework that means let us say your interface contains five methods and you are interested only in one of those methods but what is the fundamental for interface you are supposed to provide the definition for all the five methods even though if you are willing to use them or if you are not willing to use them you should provide the definition for all those methods your ejb framework contains some callback method we'll see what is meant by callback method you are supposed to provide an empty definition an empty definition for all those callback methods you are not interested to make use of those methods so that means you will be going to just import or Write that particular method with a empty method code. In your EJB 3.0, you are not going to implement any kind of interfaces. So that means it's not required for you to provide definition for any kind of callback. That's the first advantage with respect to your EJB 3.0. and the second thing is just like your web dot xml file for your web container the ejb 2.1 also requires one xml file which constitutes 
all your bean information. EJB bean store external. I didn't remember the name, sorry. But the kind of like it's also an external file. EJB bean store external file. With respect to your EJB 3.0, it's not required for you to write any EJB XML file. So it's not at all required for us to write the XML file. And one other advantage with respect to EJB 3.0. H2K Infosys provides world-class online IT training, staffing, and software testing solutions to customers worldwide. H2K Infosys, how we are different from our competitors. 100% job-oriented training, hands-on project work, cloud test lab, resume preparation and review, mock interviews, robust syllabus, one-time fee and lifetime access to classes, access to recorded sessions of live classes. H2K Infosys has won the trust of thousands of students worldwide. For a free demo class, visit us at h2kinfosys.com.